Okay. So thanks everyone uh, for coming. Um, I'm not gonna provide a detailed um, introduction for the panelists because all the panelists by bios uh, are on the webpage. So I'll just introduce very briefly. So our speakers on this panel will be Valeria Esquivel from the International uh, Labor Office, Mark Granovitter from the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, Amy Matsui from the National Women's Law Center and Lenore Palladino from University of Massachusetts Amherst. And Beth King from the Brookings Institution will be providing some uh, comments at the end. Okay. So you wanna show that special slide? Okay, so that's our panel. And the next one. Great, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, this is just some special information for us about the panel. So first of all, we wanna encourage you all to share uh, tweets about the um, webinar on social media and you can use the hashtag provided there. We're letting you know that the webinar will be recorded and this recording will make, be made available after the event. Um, you need to put your questions in the Q&A, not in the comments, and sorry, not in the chat. You can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, chat with fellow attendees using the chat button at the bottom of the screen. You can go ahead and introduce yourself there now if you're on Zoom so people know uh, who's in the audience. And closed captionings are available for attendees on Zoom. You can turn on the closed captionings by clicking on the CC or live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Thank you very much. I think Valeria is going to use slides. So yes, yes. Can... Valeria, you will be first. Uh, Praveena will get your slides queued up. So just let Praveena know when you want her to advance the slide, okay? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Looks like you're muted. So is that it? I can start? Yes, you can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, good uh, afternoon, uh, to all. Um, I am... Um, I'm going to present um, this, um, some work that we are doing at the ILO uh, in conjunction with UN Women. I will give you more details afterwards. Uh, but the title of the presentation is Investing in the Care Economy, Supporting a Gender Responsive Recovery. Uh, so I will... Um, hopefully give you a more global uh, view of these issues whilst uh, my colleagues um, after will uh, focus uh, more on, on the US. Um, the picture uh, in fact comes from uh, a publication um, in, uh, in a US uh, paper uh, speaking about care as, as social infrastructure. And I think it captures well what we are trying to, to say here. So if we can go move to the following slide, please. I can't, I understand. Okay, so um, this, uh, this is, these are results that come from uh, an ILO um, um, report, Care Work and Care Jobs for the Future of This and Work, in which we used uh, a macro model, I will explain in detail afterwards, to calculate what would be the impact of investing in the care economy, in the sectors of health and education, in order to achieve the SDGs uh, three and four, and also SDG eight, which is related to employment, and SDG five, which is related to uh, gender equality. Um, we, it's, it's, it's interesting because we took a normative take on this. Um, uh, countries in 2015 committed themselves to a certain level of development or, 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 or goals that they were going to achieve by 2030. And, and you know, as compared to the previous rounds, the, um, that these goals apply to everyone. 
both meaning uh, developing and developed countries. So in this um, global um, calculations, uh, we um, brought together the information about 45 countries, which represented at the moment in 2015, 85% of global GDP and close to 60% of the global population. And we, and, and you can have a look at the, at the at the graph while I explain it, but we we said there that um, if the investments to achieve the coverage um, implied in SDG 4 and 3 were made, we could go from 206 million um, um, in, um, jobs to 475 job, million jobs in 2030. This um, the the first uh, stop. Uh, the second the second uh, bar is what we call the status quo scenario, and the status quo scenario is keeping the coverage of 2015 and the working conditions of 2015. And we see there that there is more investment required, and therefore more jobs by simply the simple fact of um, um, populations expanding and, and requiring therefore more services uh, uh, as, as long -term, in long-term care in particular and early childhood education. The high road, this, the third bar, the, the, the full scenario, is one in which the, uh, the better coverage uh, are achieved uh, and also that the, um, the working conditions of care workers are improved. In this high road a scenario, however, or it implies uh, more than one third of expenditure increase in education and one fifth increase in health and social work globally. This means that in our calculations, the level of expenditure in these uh, services, in, in the whole of care and the, uh, the whole of uh, healthcare and social work and the whole of education would go from 8.7% of the aggregated GDP of these countries to 14.9% in 2030 in the uh, status quo scenario and for uh, to 18.3% uh, of GDP in the high road scenario at the end of the period that is in 2030. And at least 17% of the expenditure could be recovered in the short run through fiscal revenues. I'm, I'm taking the time to explain this because the logic is that investing in these uh, services is um, resource intensive, but it cannot be and shouldn't be done without improving the working conditions of care workers. And I think that was a strong message of, of the care report, as we call it um, in-house. Uh, and that strong message is associated to the fact that we strongly believe that the working conditions of the care of care workers are translated into the, the uh, quality of care. And I think also the um, one thing the care report did um, almost uh, five years uh, ago, or four years ago, was to, uh, to um, focus not only on long-term care and early childhood education, which are the, um, of course, least covered and least um, uh, expanded of care um, services, but also uh, contemplate education and health that are not as expanded as, um, as uh, they, they are in uh, high income countries. I will move rapidly to, to the following one, please. Um, because what I wanted to, um, to show is um, the, um, the, the policy tool that we based on the care report uh, we design as part of the um, um, joint program that UN Women and ILO are, are running. Uh, and one of the, the pillars of, uh, 
the, the joint program has three pillars, but one of those is investments in, in, in the care um, economy. So the policy tool provides a methodology on how to identify the coverage gaps uh, at the country level, estimate the cost of public investments and expenditure needed to um, close those uh, gaps, and assess the returns uh, including in employment. The following one, please. Um, and the basically something I already said that investing in the care economy means investing in the whole of education, early childhood uh, care uh, and education and primary and secondary education, and also health and care services. The following, please. Um, Okay, uh, so I will uh, go rapidly. Uh, of course, there are links here, so you can you can see them. I will go rapidly through the three steps because I want to get to the end um, on on some on on a macro uh, thinking about this. So first uh, part is the overview of the coverage gaps and these um this is um th the tool explains in detail how it, it has to be done um including uh, who is in charge of of uh, i mean which authority should be covering these these gaps and how to um how to design um uh, care services and expansion of care services adapted but to to the different countries step two the following please um is uh is estimating the the cost and here i think it is very important to adjust the cost for service quality and for employment quality so it's not reproducing the current conditions in many countries these conditions are insufficient something that the COVID crisis proved but improving the quality i mean progressively if you want but improving the quality of the service provided uh which usually has to do with the ratios of um uh, students and, and uh, the relationship bet between students and teachers or nurses and doctors to population, for example. And the step three is analyzing the economic returns, um, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, associated to doing macroeconomic simulations. The following, please. And, and that uh, those economic returns are associated to First of first and foremost, the employment creation that these uh, investments bring with it, decent employment in, in our, uh, we want to emphasize, uh, growth in other outcomes, in particular productivity, although that is, um, th there are issues I think we could uh, talk about later about how badly um productivity in care sectors is is calculated and tax revenues uh um, through the demand uh the demand side of 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 this um investment i have to say also uh that uh there are two issues that the tool emphasizes less but we have to pay attention to one is is the skills planning uh in order to have medical doctors in eight years or 10 years, we need to plan for training them. And the same happens with, with teachers. That's one. Uh, and second, the, the, um, um, the, the impacts are long-term. Uh, so, so in a way, uh, capturing those uh, revenues or those um, returns, sorry, uh, it, it, is, it, it, it won't happen immediately and we have to have that uh, into account. Um, the following please, and I think is coming to an end. Uh, so I wanted to emphasize on, 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 on this and, and, and the fact that um, that we have to plan for a different recovery, uh, not coming back to, to normal, but to invent a new and fairer and, and more care, caring future. Uh, one of the ways out 
of uh, the crisis is to promoting the appropriate public and private investments in care sectors. And we understand these as part of uh, a more gender responsive approach to recovery, which ad addresses effectively the gender specific um, 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 impacts of this crisis, but also brings in this um, sectoral perspective, if you have, and the potential that uh, care sectors have in order to channel um, investment to these sectors, which would uh, enable uh, more demand and therefore uh, hopefully a, a, a speedy uh, a recovery, but also one recovery that uh, sets uh, the foundations for a different and human-centered uh, economy. I would stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valeria, for staying uh, nicely on time. So I think Lenore was going next, although the order seems to be a little different on the program. But Lenore, did you want to go next? Sure, I'm happy to. How's my sound? Your sound is good. Let us just get your slides. One minute. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's really great to see the uh, people from around the world popping up in the chat, I think, especially in a time of Global, so much global turmoil. It's actually really wonderful to be here with a global community that's focused on issues of care. Um, so great. My name is Lenore Palladino. I'm an assistant professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I'm going to talk about some research that I conducted with um, a graduate student at UMass named Chirag Lala that's investigating the macro, macroeconomic impacts of investments in home health care childcare and universal paid leave in the United States. This is drawing from a working paper that's published on the website of the Political Economy Research Institute at UMass Amherst, and I'll put a link in after I uh, stop talking. We took our foundation from one of the Build Back Better proposals that the Biden-Harris administration had made in 2021 and built off of it a macroeconomic model that has a lot to do with exactly with what Valeria was talking about, I'll go through and tell you some of the specific assumptions we made for the case of the United States. And also, just because I know this is a very, uh, you know, there's, there's students here, there's, there's people with all sorts of different backgrounds here, I'll try to talk a little bit about why we want to look at investment in care from a macroeconomic perspective. So just to give you the punchline right up front, what we're doing is looking at $100 billion of annual investment, which it was uh, the assumption of one of the many versions of the Build Back Better proposal, uh, split across paid leave, home health care, and child care. Even though I think, as Valeria said, it's very important to think about care holistically, in the United States, the structures of K through 12 education and hospitals and other forms of health care are just structured very differently. So we focused on paid leave, home care and child care um, as specific programs. We found that an investment of this level would create 1.4 million care jobs, uh, 2 million jobs in total and around 81 billion in total labor income. And if you can go to the first, my first slide that'll just give the audience some visuals of the big numbers I'm giving. Um, so the, the next slide there for me. I don't know if it's, it's not a going forward for me, but that's okay. Um, well, yeah, wait, hold on one second. No, we're just, we're just a little stuff right now. Hmm. Well, why don't, it's, it's not a big deal. I'll keep going just so we don't lose time. Okay. Let me talk for a minute about why we're doing this modeling, just so people who may be less familiar with this concept can get uh, a little bit more of an understanding. So there's a variety of positive economic benefits that result from investing in care, right? And we're going to hear, uh, um, we've been hearing about that throughout the whole conference and on this panel as well. Those include increased workforce stability and labor force participation, especially for women and people of color, increased health, both, both physical and mental for workers and their families, increased uh, investment in children's development, these are well studied, right? What I'm looking at specifically is what happens once newly employed childcare and home healthcare workers go out and spend their earnings, right? And what happens when people who were formerly taking unpaid leave from their jobs 
now we're able to go out and actually spend the income that they have gotten through a simulated public leave program uh, that they did not have before as earnings. So we're looking at this cycle of earnings and consumption. That's really what, macro, uh, ma what macroeconomics is about. And we can trace people's spending through the economy based on the percentage of their earnings that people spend versus save. This is not a static figure across all of us uh, through the economy. We know that generally low income people spend more of their earnings right away on basic goods and services as, uh, as providing for themselves and their families. So what we're modeling here is outcomes in the economy in terms of the total jobs and total amount of labor income people will earn based on the set of relationships about how new dollars invested in sectors like childcare and home health care and also are um, provided to people taking paid leave as labor income, how that translates into new economic activity in other parts of the economy. Uh, we're looking specifically at how it induces employment and how it creates new kinds of labor income. So one, I, I'm going to tell you the results from this in a, in a minute, but one other aspect I wanted to raise that we, uh, I think, is a little bit unique in our modeling, although definitely builds on Valeria's modeling as well, is that we really felt that we could not look at a public investment in child care and home health care without directly accounting for raising wages of the current workforce. So I can talk about, or, or offline probably with uh, anyone who's interested, talk about sort of the technical details of how we did this, but we absolutely cannot settle for uh, the kinds of wages that home health care workers and child care workers are making today. Any sort of public investment in the United States needs to account for a base level. We chose $15 an hour. That's not perfect. In some states, it should be higher. Uh, but as a sort of baseline figure, we, in our modeling, raised wages of uh, both current employees as part of the public investment, and then also of the new employment that we're simulating that would emerge as a result of increased in activity in child care and home health care. Though I would have loved to, we didn't have the technical ability to raise wages of people who are receiving paid leave, but we know that a large percentage of people who would be recipients of the new public paid leave program should also uh, benefit from higher uh, federal minimum wages and other wage increases. Okay, so um, if you can go, this slide actually shows our top line results. And what I'm going to do is talk specifically about uh, paid leave, then child care and home health care, uh, just to give you a little bit of a better sense. Oh, it looks like it disappeared again. That's okay. <laughs> um, so in our analysis of paid leave, we took a proposal from the American Families Plan, which would increase household income, uh, people who did not previously get paid leave from their employers or from state programs who are simulated through um, a whole bunch of assumptions based on a, a wonderful tool that the Department of Labor has built, who are simulated to need public paid leave and would, be, uh, would benefit from it under a public paid leave program, they would earn $19.1 million in what we can call wage replacement or uh, paid leave income as a result of the program. Then we were able to see, okay, what would be the effects of them going out and spending this money throughout the economy we found roughly that for every dollar of paid uh, wage replacement through the paid leave program, other workers in the economy, workers who are not themselves receiving paid leave from the program, would earn an additional 50 cents. So that's, a, I think, a really interesting result in terms of thinking about the impact of care, uh, investment in care on the macro economy. Um, we see, and you can see this in the percentages in the second and third row here, unsurprisingly, paid medical and family leave disproportionately benefits those in the workforce who are also likely to be family caregivers. Women are 53% of new leave takers, while women earning $15 an hour and below are 27% of new leave takers. Um, you can go to the next slide. Another feature of this that may be uh, very hard for people in the audience to read, but I'll just sort of tell you the story of this table. It's very important to understand as well the racial equity impacts of an investment in paid leave in the United States. So I won't uh, go down all the figures, but the, the uh, upshot of the story is that the beneficiaries of a simulated publicly available paid leave program are more are disproportionately women and low wage uh, women of color and low wage women 
uh, disproportionate to their representation in the overall workforce. In other words, investment in a public wave program uh, has positive effects in terms of racial equity, gender equity, and uh, equity for women of color in particular. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, so let me finally talk briefly about the results that we see from investment in both childcare and home health care. These two analyses were done uh, in a very similar fashion. What we look at is if, as Build Back Better had proposed, there was roughly $40 billion invested in each sector in a given year, what would be the impact in terms of new jobs created in that sector itself, so new home health care workers and new child care workers to meet the desperate need uh, in both of those industries, both of those sectors for, for workers and obviously for families. And then we look specifically at, okay, if those new workers and the workers that currently, to, you know, without the simulation, work in those two sectors, if all of those workers now earn a minimum of $15 and up, and then we raised wages of people uh, earning above $15 by sort of proportionally less uh, over, over a scale, if that investment happens, how will, those, how will the new workforce that is better compensated go out and spend money throughout the rest of the economy? And just briefly, we see, and this makes sense if you think about low wage workers spend the majority of their earnings, we see lots of uh, additional job creation, especially in sectors like retail and food service and other kinds of sectors that are really consumption heavy for low wage workers. So we found that proposed investments in, uh, for example, in childcare here, you can see that the simulated new childcare jobs are about 650,000, which results in not quite, but almost a doubling of the childcare workforce post this investment and also results in what we call induced job creation, new jobs of other workers throughout the economy of about 130,000. And then if you can go to the final slide here. Similarly for home healthcare, it has a much larger uh, starting um, uh, set of employees. We see that a 40 billion investment a year would create almost 800,000 new jobs, uh, which is in some estimates about the current need for home healthcare, although that's, pre-pandemic, so probably even uh, much more now. And those new workers would similarly create almost about 200,000 new jobs through their ac increased economic activity. So finally, let me just mention you know, the methodology for all this. I'm happy to talk about with people offline. It uses uh, input-output data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And then I just wanna put in a plug, the paid leave research builds on a publicly available tool from the Department of Labor, Labor called the uh, worker plus micro simulation model, both excellent tools that, you know, anyone in the audience who's thinking about doing dissertation work or, or further um, empirical research on care, I really encourage you to take, uh, take advantage of those resources and for all of us to tell the story of the macroeconomic effect in care uh, as part of the reason why the American economy needs this investment. Not only does it benefit uh, all of us and our families, it benefits the workers who work in these industries, and then it benefits the entire economy as those workers go out and increase their own economic activity, which has spillovers throughout the whole economy. So I'll pause there and look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. Okay, thanks so much, Lenore. Um, I just wanted to suggest uh, to you and uh, any other panelists, if there's anything you want to share with the audience, like the link to that tool, for example, you can put it in the chat. Uh, so uh, Amy or Mark, I'm not sure uh, which of you decided to go next. I'll go Amy. ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Amy Matsui. I'm Director of Income Security at the National Women's Law Center, which is an advocacy and public policy organization that's nonpartisan nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel and part of this really robust and interesting conversation. I'm going to focus my remarks in particular on child care. So I know that much of what I'm going to say is familiar from the plenary, and I'm sure that these themes come up in many people's work and in the other sessions, but I wanted to reiterate them here to kind of set up the macroeconomic impacts of our inequitable and fragile childcare system, which were so kind of um, beautifully set up by um, Lenore and Valeria. 
it's important again to remember that because workers can't go to work without childcare if they have children, employers, um, communities, and the economy as a whole really depend on a robust and functioning childcare system. The failure to treat childcare as a public good and invest accordingly has therefore left us with a childcare system that really puts the onus on individual actors within the system to meet need that benefits all of us employers, local communities, and the economy writ large. So just to break that down a little bit, families, individual families where the adults are working struggle to access and pay for the high quality care that they need to work and that their children need to foster healthy development and learning. Child care providers are operating on the tightest of margins and one of their greatest costs is going to be labor. I also wanted to note that for some smaller providers, including family child care providers, providers may be subsidizing families and helping them out because they know how much the, their, the families of children they serve are struggling to make end meet, ends meet. And then just to kind of add the, the additional third component in here, child care workers are some of the lowest paid um, sectors in the country, they're averaging less than $12 an hour and frequently lack benefits, so they can't support their families on their low wages alone. And you may have seen studies from the Berkeley Center for the Child Care Workforce noting this very significant proportion of child care workers who rely on public benefits, SNAP, um, refundable tax credits in order to make ends meet. And on top of this, I want to flag that the work that this that this sector is doing, caring for the youngest members of society and, and supporting their healthy development and early learning, they're not getting commensurate professional development and training that helps to support them in this important work. So one of the reasons that I talk about the childcare system and, and describe it as inequitable is that, and what will not be a surprise to anyone here, is that when you have an underfunded and inadequate system, there are going to be particularly detrimental effects that can be broken out by race and gender. So just for an example, um, to the extent that it's hardest for low-income families to access and pay for care, households of color and women-headed households are, are overrepresented among those lower-income families. And then another theme which has been really highlighted during the pandemic is there's this chicken and egg cycle where the compounding of kind of traditional norms and expectations along gender lines for who in a family provides unpaid care work, caring for children, along with kind of the reinforcement of um, lower wages. So if uh, you know a member of a, of a family where there's a married couple, who is gonna end up taking care of children when there's not childcare available, it appears to be an economically rational decision to have that person be um, the woman and in most cases, the mother. In addition, I just wanna flag that workers in this sector are predominantly over 90% female and their overrepresentation of people of color and immigrant women as well. So when these women and workers are not paid what their work and can't meet their family's needs, we have a really depressed um, wages in this sector that does traditionally gendered work. And then finally, I just wanna to point to the fact that providers who, as I mentioned, are working on these very tight margins with labor being one of their highest costs. Again, it's a kind of a continually reinforcing cycle that providers who are in low income areas, who are providers of color, may not have a lot of cushion. They may not have resources to fall back on. We saw in particular during the pandemic that when providers were pushed to the margins and had higher costs, they were taking out personal loans, they were using credit card to kind of float their businesses. And so which both where there are um, kind of childcare lacks are going to be in underserved areas. And as well, those providers that are kind of more precarious are going to be low income, often female and often providers of color. So I wanted to point out that, you know, we do have a child care assistance program for working families with low incomes, but it likewise is not fully funded and many eligible families are not served. The last available data is that one in six eligible children received assistance through the child care and development block grant. Unfortunately for those families, 
eligible or just above the eligibility line, if they don't receive assistance, they still have to work. So the question is, what kind of care are they going to be able to afford? Um, there's a downstream effect where, you know, low income families who don't have adequate support through the child care assistance program might have to rely on free or very low cost child care from family members, neighbors or friends in the informal care sector. This may be a family's preference, it may be culturally appropriate care, but it does place some children at risk and these children are predominantly in low income families and often in communities of color, that those children may not have access to the kind of care that fully supports their developmental and learning needs. I also wanted to make the point that while some child care and development block grants do go to systemic supports like supporting the workforce, quality improvements for providers, targeting towards infant and toddler care, but for families who aren't um, able to get this, the child care assistance, even if they're eligible, or for families who are even a dollar above CCDBG's income limits, many of the supports or solutions to the extent they exist are also individual. So for example, the child and development care, the child and development tax credit is a tax credit that's um, designed to partially offset work-related out-of-pocket costs paid for child and dependent care throughout the year. So in 2021, as a result of the American Rescue Plan Act, this credit is larger and it's refundable, but up until now and in current law, since the, the tax credit was only applicable for 2021, it's a non-refundable tax credit that only reduces tax liability. It doesn't give people more to pay for expenses even going forward. And for many low-income families, it provided no value at all. Similarly, employers may but are not required to offer dependent care assistance plans, which are cafeteria plan type accounts where um, workers can put pre-tax dollars away in these accounts to pay for child and dependent care expenses. In um, pre and post 2021, the limit for those expenses is $5,000. In 2021, it was almost, it was doubled. Um, however, you know, even though having the pre-tax benefit means that the dollars are used smarter, it still doesn't give people any more to pay for child and dependent care. In addition, employers aren't required to offer this benefit. It tends to be eligible only for higher income um, workers who are best able to afford putting that money aside. Um, last but not least, I wanna mention a couple of state level programs that are intended to boost the workforce. TEACH is one of these programs. Um, they're not available in every state. And in addition, some states like Louisiana do offer a tax credit model for boosting salaries for childcare providers and workers, but they're often tied to credentials, the quality rating of the, um, um, the child care center that they're, that they're um, located in. And again, they're not available in every state. So I want to kind of pivot by just, again, highlighting how COVID showed us that not the system is not only inequitable, but extraordinarily fragile. And obviously, the shock to the child care system posed by the COVID pandemic had macroeconomic effects, especially for women. So first, just to point out that the childcare workforce was hit incredibly hard by job loss. It lost nearly one in eight jobs or 12.4% since the start of the crisis. In addition, as we saw the expectation of people going back to work, the economy kind of continuing its uneven recovery around the turn of the year, there are significant childcare worker shortages because childcare workers may be able to earn more in other jobs they are often leaving jobs that work that they're deeply committed to that serves a tremendous need and value in society because they can't afford to continue to do it. Um, the closures in the childcare sector throughout the pandemic were driven by health and safety measures, which reduced the number of children who could be served while increasing the costs and expenses that providers were bearing. This put additional strain on the system, both on the provider side and on parents. And then I just wanted to note that women's employment, as the previous two panelists pointed out, has been hit incredibly hard. Over 1 million women have left the workforce altogether. That means they're not working or looking for work. 
since February 2020. You know, the lack of childcare is not the only reason that women with school aged children left their jobs, but it was certainly a significant part of the story. And low wage jobs in which women were overrepresented had significantly less flexibility or ability to work from home. We've seen a significant gender disparity where women were more likely to leave the labor force for caregiving. And by some measures, um, nearly 15% of all women ages 25 to 44 were working, were not working because of childcare problems compared to 2% of similar aged men by spring 2021. Conversely, there's a pretty robust um, body of research showing that when childcare is accessible and affordable, it does boost women's ability to engage in paid work. And right now, when we're seeing historically low rates of women's labor force participation dating back to the 80s, um, it's important to put this in place. And again, you know, during the Omicron wave, when much of the federal aid had, has already expired, we saw that past is going to be prologue where there's an expectation that people are back at work, parents have to are going to work, but the childcare system continues to be fragile and the place where the gaps in the system are filled are by women having to bear that up. So I wanna just close by pointing to the fact that the solution here is not a system that relies on the um, ingenuity creativity and um, kind of detriment to women's workforce participation and economic security by instead creating a comprehensive, robust, and equitable system that treats childcare as a public good that supports all of us. The proposal that was in the House passed version of the Build Back Better Act is a start and would provide a tremendous foundation for the future system that we all envision. And I want to close by noting that to support these investments we need that we need and deserve, we do need to raise a significant amount of general revenues, but we can do that through fairer and more progressive tax policies. Mark, I know is going to delve into that more in detail, but I just want to close by submitting to you that this could certainly include better and more progressive ways of taxing wealth. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Amy. Okay, Mark, it's your turn. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mark. I work with uh, AFSME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Um, how is my sound? Excellent. And I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, you know, there are many substantive opportunities in the care infrastructure debate, many being considered now, some medium or longer term for the future. While advocates have built to this moment for years, if, if not decades, uh, you know, the ongoing COVID crisis coupled with the current House and Senate leadership and President Biden suggests, uh, you know, now is an excellent time to leverage some of these opportunities. Uh, you know, from the broad view, uh, as Amy alluded to, America has more than enough resources to accomplish these care goals and fulfill our obligations. You know, for advocates and, and policy types, uh, hopefully for this audience, you know, the task is to drive a national dialogue that prioritizes helping those in need at the national, state, and local levels. Uh, the challenge, as with so many other public policy and economic issues, is, is to allocate uh, and distribute, or, or perhaps redistribute, the resources. While the debate is often driven by you know, moral claims and competing messages, uh, a huge piece of this is, is practical and economic, as you've heard about labor participation rates, uh, you know, keeping families that are struggling uh, together, uh, making sure that uh, family and loved ones are able to uh, deliver the care uh, that that's needed, um, and, and you know most importantly, uh, you know this should unleash the the vibrant potential of our entire population. Um, you know certainly in our children, uh, adults, retirees, and uh, you know in the in the broader economy, whether it's at a national basis or or in certain communities. Um, I wanted to highlight four points. Uh, one is that the, the care economy has numerous and varied stakeholders. And from an advocacy uh, perspective, they're generally aligned. Uh, they're certainly recipients of care. They're direct and indirect beneficiaries of that care. They're the care workers, both direct care providers and uh, care infrastructure workers who facilitate, coordinate, and administer the services. They're CBOs, community-based organizations, and, and employers who, uh, you know, in many ways will uh, benefit from the flexibilities that, uh, you know, the care economy provides and uh, more opportunity for fuller labor force participation of uh, all those that are interested. Um, they're also identity-based or, you know, demographically focused groups. 
Um, some of those are um, made up of people that suffer from some of the same problems. Sometimes it's uh, some of the groups that are before you today. Uh, and there are many more stakeholders in that space. Uh, the second point I want to highlight is that um, the diverse stakeholders can and should organize together where possible to expand the care infrastructure and the delivery system. You know, the goals you've heard of here, broaden eligibility for benefits, raise those benefits, compensate care workers adequately, and ultimately improve services to people in need and their families. Um, given uh, AFSCME's position, my, my third point is something we call the union difference. Being in a union provides uh, often added pay and benefits. It's also about respect for the work uh, people do. Uh, it's being safe and protected on the job, which uh, you know COVID has demonstrated uh, is so important. Having resources and training to as well. And if something's not right in the workplace, uh, the union difference can help people join together to develop solutions. And uh, you know, I think the the big picture. For, for us and uh, workers is that in, in the care economy, there's ample, ample opportunity for growth in, in this space. Uh, the, the final point I wanna highlight is uh, progressive federal tax revenues and policies. You know, American support and Congress can enact legislation that increases federal revenues significantly to help fund the care economy, uh, expand and enhance these services and ensure there's adequate compensation for, for the sector's workforce. Um, so I wanted to start off with, with, with workers in the workforce. Um, you know, the direct care workers are vital to staffing the care economy and typically the center of policy discussion and debate. And, and we've, we've, we've certainly heard uh, about that over time and, and in this panel. There's another class of workers who help uh, connect potential beneficiaries with federal, state, local benefits. They also have a vital, if less heralded, role uh, in, in supporting and connecting uh, individuals with benefits. Uh, this latter category could include social workers, service coordinators, service administrators, and those that are determining eligibility, eligibility claims and benefits. I highlight those in part because AFSCME represents many of these workers in social service jobs. But second, they do play this vital unheralded role facilitating the delivery system. And um, some of those folks in the direct care occupations and in the um, service coordinator and administrative roles are already unionized. I think there's an opportunity to um, in improving the system. And we here at AFSCME and allied unions are, are working overall to uh, bring up those standards. We uh, heard earlier about you know, $15 as a potential wage uh, point in the modeling. Um, there's other benefits that are available, whether it's health, retirement, uh, and uh, other uh, issues that will help bring up uh, the workforce and uh, make things uh, more, more smooth and improved. Um, you've, you've heard already about childcare. I do wanna touch briefly on um, home and community-based services, uh, sometimes known as in-home Medicaid services. Uh, and then briefly, I'm gonna touch on uh, some of the service coordinators in the context of, of public housing. But uh, you know, earlier last year, roughly in March, after taking office, President Biden and Congressional Democrats Build Back Better plan contained increased funds to help seniors and people with disabilities and direct care workers. Um, initially, Biden requested $400 billion to strengthen home and community-based services, uh, the infrastructure, expand access for seniors, people with disabilities, and, and increase and strengthen the workforce. Um, thereafter, the Congressional Democrats proposed three specific provisions that would help implement Biden's American Jobs Plan proposal. Um, you know, just, just to highlight for a moment, um, home and community-based services boil down to assisting people with self-care, eating, bathing, toileting, supportive household activities, preparing meals, uh, really helping with activities of daily life, uh, ADLs. Um, and most, most of the time they're provided through Medicaid and not covered by other payers, including Medicare, although of course there's uh, a lot of variation in um, the way um, the process plays out for families in different parts of the country. But, you know, we need this type of investment. Certainly, again, COVID has um, ravaged nursing homes and group settings and made it more attractive, if not necessary, to have individuals uh, more either in their home or in a much less, uh, more alone or, or, or in a better home setting that could provide more uh, protection from, from COVID and health concerns. 
there's been, um, of course, currently underserved need for, for home care for a long time. And the demographics that uh, we know about are pushing towards um, more need in the future. Um, but going back to the, um, the plan that we initially heard from President Biden, congressional Democrats, there were three particular um, items uh, that, that I want to mention. Uh, money follows the person, spousal impoverishment protections, and um, you know, the overall uh, funding level. And the money follows the person is important to ensure that people uh, have these services in their home and are not, um, in essence, staying in a facility. Um, spousal impoverishment protections are important because if uh, a couple um, are together often for many years and one individual um, needs these services and the other doesn't, it is unfair to um, you know, cause uh, that uh, health need um, to really um, you know, just create problems for, for the family and, and potentially put them into poverty. Um, you know, ultimately, that $400 billion initial proposal was um, reduced to $190 billion in the initial um, House of Representatives program. And of course, we're still working on um, those packages moving through, through Congress. Um, uh, I just want to touch briefly on um, you know, resident opportunities and self-sufficiency grant program and a family self-sufficiency program in public housing. These are programs where service coordinators help deliver um, an evaluation of the needs of the residents. They coordinate community resources, and they're really the glue that bring together um, the services that individuals need. In those cases, uh, you know, the, the care could be provided in a separate setting. It could be in public housing. And uh, you know, those service coordinators and um, the whole evaluation effort is, is really integral to making sure that um, individuals receive the services that they're entitled to and that they need. Um, the union difference, just for a moment, uh, you know, some statistics, union members earn, according to some studies, as much as 20% more than non-union workers. While 96% of union members might have access to a health plan, it's about 70% for non-union workers. 94% of union members have access to retirement benefits. Uh, it's much less, again, about two thirds for non-union workers. Uh, you know, in California, after many years, AFSCME and other unions helped organize California childcare workers. Uh, you know, that resulted in an immediate 15% pay increase and um, there'll be other benefits as well. The last point to really hit on is the progressive revenues. Um, you know, broadly speaking, the goal is to, um, raise revenues uh, at this stage, not directly and exclusively linked to funding of the specific investments in the care economy. Um, the, the package over the last year that's been proposed and I think where uh, members of Congress, the president and the advocacy community comes down is um, there won't be dedicated revenue streams. Instead, the plan has been to raise revenues from varied sources, put, them, put those revenues in a package. The package also funds new investments for the care economy and other, other needs. And while that package's investments would be offset by the revenues, again, the package is not explicitly linked specific revenues to specific investments. Overall, um, what, what policies are there? Uh, we need to strengthen the IRS Internal Revenue Service enforcement of existing federal tax laws to raise revenues that are already owed. Um, we need to close the federal tax gap, and that would um, generate hundreds of billions of dollars. We also should require the wealthiest 1%, whether that's millionaires, billionaires, large profitable corporations to pay their fair share of taxes. Public opinion polls demonstrate strong public support for these revenue measures. Two thirds, 70% of uh, the general population, uh, more than half of um, Republicans in some cases, two thirds of independents and Democrats support these progressive revenues. Um, the um, particular items that we could look at would be raising the individual top rate uh, going back to what it had been before the 2017 tax law was passed, up to 39.6%. There are proposals for a millionaire surtax, a very simple idea, simply a surtax on the top income rate of several percentage points applied to incomes in excess of a million dollars per year. There's been talk about the wealth tax that uh, Amy mentioned. Uh, there's a, a billionaire's tax uh, that's also being discussed that would... Um, in essence, impose a tax on the appreciation of assets in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, the jargon is unrealized capital gains. Individuals that might have purchased stock a long time ago in Amazon or Berkshire Hathaway or um, you know, other entities, that stock has appreciated over time. Individuals have made a lot of money. 
Uh, and un unfortunately, the way things work now, that's not taxed. Um, if we could tax the appreciation as is being proposed in legislation by Senator Wyden and others, um, that would help um, equalize thing. Whereas workers receive a W, um, as a W-2, they receive their um, 1040, uh, when they do their tax forms, you know, there's a set amount of wages uh, they get every year. We know what those are and they're taxed on those wages. And that's not the same for, for um, millionaires and billionaires that have their uh, assets appreciating in capital gains. Um, on the corporate side, there's a minimum corporate tax that's been discussed, 15%. That's linked to an international effort underway. Um, President Biden and his team are, you know, having negotiated some uh, international efforts, are uh, pushing for the 15% minimum tax. We could also raise the corporate tax, whereas before 2017, it had been 35%. It's now at 21%. A mid-range increase would put it at 28%, and um, that has been part of the uh, Build Back Better and congressional negotiations. Um, the, the last option, generally speaking, is to end corporate tax incentives that would send uh, you know, jobs and profits overseas. Um, we heard in the um, State of the Union, uh, and, and certainly the international context now is highlighting the importance of um, you know, domestic production of, of goods and services, and this would help um, you know, strengthen the workforce here in the States. Uh, in conclusion, um, you know, we think the care economy stakeholders, as varied as they are, are fundamentally aligned in, in an effort to bring together the resources and, and benefits and, and help individuals in need. Um, there's ample opportunity to join together, advocate for these revenues, which should help drive these investments and ultimately increase the likelihood of enactment. Um, so the hope is that we can um, you know, bridge the, the differences uh, in the different occupations, the, the different um, uh, crises that bring people to, to need care and um, you know, work together, uh, continuing to try to um, invest uh, and hopefully uh, move this legislation um, as soon as we can. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, okay, so now we're going to turn to uh, Beth King from the Brookings Institution, who's going to kick us off with a few questions or comments. Thank you, Mika. So I'm just struck by the powerful argument that <clears throat> the panelists have made for more spending on care, more, you know, better policies for care. This and the panel before um, are just amazing. And it makes me wonder so much why, you know, when I, I, I saw this uh, uh, paper by Claudia Olivetti and Barbara Petrongolo, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which was in 2017, before the pandemic. And she compi they compiled, um, the, they compared uh, uh, 15 high income countries. I think that's more than 15 even. And the US is way at the bottom with you know zero maternity uh, leave mandated paid, uh, per year, et cetera, et cetera. It, it just struck me as how such a rich country, a democratic country, who that means to say people vote for their leaders could be so far below all these other countries, high income countries. And I was wondering, you know, this it's very good to talk about these care policies that are now being discussed, that are now being voted on. I wonder, besides the pandemic that happened, which affected all people at, or almost all people around the same level, what else has changed that could actually pivot the US from where it's been in terms of policies for care to the kinds of things we're talking about today? It seems to me there's an underlying question there for discussion. What was it that was stopping the US from having a more humane, a more people-friendly, family-friendly, child-friendly set of policies? It's very difficult to understand why that is. What was the reason that stopped debate and decision-making on this very important set of policies, which we know 
as economists and non-economists actually have can have a huge impact on employment, on income, on welfare, on the future of the country, as your different studies have shown. What is it? I have not heard a reason for this. Why would, uh, why would, what would stop the, what's affecting the politics that goes against these kinds of policies? Is it because the business, is it concern for the capitalists really that's been, that stopped the US from doing anything that actually other capitalist countries have done? So it, it seems like, I know it's not exactly macroeconomics, but it, it seems to me part of the macro picture, right? So that's, that is actually one thing that has been troubling me a lot. What is it that's changed other than the pandemic? That, that can move the kinds of policies that we, that we are talking about. And is there, and one of the things that also uh, troubles me a little bit, and maybe because I did not understand uh, all the discussions and maybe particularly Lenore's uh, three types of care policies is the difference, but was very much there for Valeria, the difference between paid and unpaid family care. Because it's easier to actually provide revenues and subsidies, sorry about this, uh, to, 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 uh, through paid delivery, right? And much harder to really um, uh, support unpaid home care. And that's when you don't have a, a, a receipt, an invoice, for example, to, uh, to be able to benefit from the tax credit. Now, I realize that the, the, the direct cash transfers for, the, for children, that's, you, you can, well, everybody can, can, can access those. But how about the other things that, how about the other uh, kinds of policies that we were talking about? And how about, uh, and I am a little bit disappointed that we didn't talk about much about um, elder care, given that, as Mark was saying, the demographics is actually telling us that it's coming. This problem of how to take care of our older people and long-term care for them. Um, Who's going to, who is actually going to bear the brunt of this long-term care for the older people? So I think we need to think about, I mean, I'm excited about all these childcare policies because the, the US still has one of the sort of fertility rates that's not way at the bottom, right? And because it is the people of, uh, the more disadvantaged people, people of color, and poorer people who are actually uh, having more kids. So the, the, the fertility rate is also not the same across all of the segments of the population. So I understand also that, if the, 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 um, the, that, that that's a progressive uh, attention, a, a pro progressive in, 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 in the way of who's gonna benefit. But the demographics is there and the world as a, as a whole and the US in particular is aging rapidly. So who will, how will we, the, the long-term care issues, I think is very, uh, very important for us to, to think about. I love the fact that you mentioned, uh, this, it was you who mentioned that on the, was it you Amy on the, my immigration policies? Because I think, or maybe it was Mark, is because I really think that immigration policies cannot be dissociated from care policies. It, it, it's, it's just, as Valeria was saying, it's just reality. And so it's not, uh, it's not about who's taking our jobs in terms, of, in, in this immigration policies. It's Who's, who's going to actually, the, the women are the ones who are actually going to benefit most from better immigration policies, more rational immigration policies, 
less emotional immigration policies. So I think uh, in, uh, macroeconomic policies should actually tackle more closely the link between immigration policies and the care policies and tax policies. It just makes sense given who's taking care of our kids, who's taking care of our older parents. Um, the the cost of the whole so we we discussed a lot of the you know the benefits and the employment benefits and how it's going to eventually promote uh, hopefully growth of the economy. Mark talked about um, the cost and all the things that. Um, uh, all the costs and, and how to um, how to pay for these uh, care policies. What what is the division of costs between the federal government and the state government? In in all these things that we're talking about, how does the what is if you look at the whole thing? What is the what is the responsibility of states in terms of bo both uh, delivery of services? And, and the costs, right? And I wanted to know also, there must be, when we talk about the uh, general, the, the, the general attitude in the country about care policies and family policies, there must be a lot of heterogeneity across states. And it would be good to actually really name the states that are doing much better in terms of care policies. And the extent to which they are benefiting from better care policies. Because that to me is proof of the pudding is really to call out the states that are doing some of the things that we've been discussing and are benefiting from it. So it, it's not just about the aggregate, it's also about the fact that there's so much difference across I believe across the states. And if we are talking about championing care policies, it would help to actually champion the states who are actually, who actually have better care policies, because then those are closer. Never mind what other countries in Europe are doing, because you know, there are all reasons that people will say why, you know, we're not socialists, we're not whatever, right? To say, we don't want to listen to those. But how about how about within the U.S.? So, so as you can see, I have more questions really than I have comments because I, you are telling me you you educated me about the hope of this administration for care policies, and I hope they will happen. But there are people who you would expect would support the policies, given the non the absence of such policies before and who are not supported. So my question more is, well, how, how does this happen? How does the macroeconomic analysis help in this regard? Because we're, we're hearing more about costs than about the benefits. And how are we going to use the good experiences within the United States to actually support uh, the 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 uh, proposals that are on on the table uh, right now before it's too late. Great. Thank you, Beth. Uh, okay, so I'll turn back to the speakers. If anyone wants to pick up any, any of the questions that uh, Beth has asked, otherwise we'll take some additional questions. Malaria. I I would like also, but uh, I don't know if we go in. I mean, whatever the the. The order you prefer. That's okay. We can take a minute to have the panelists respond. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Barbara. <laughs> okay, because I think uh, Beth, uh, the comments are are fantastic, but also people are in the chat, and 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 uh, it is interesting conversation. I uh, so certainly I cannot answer about the US. I mean, people have answered, but I would turn the question, why is it that has happened somewhere else? And in particular, how is it that the agenda, the care agenda has progressed, not in high income countries, but in other 
unequal and not as rich countries. And I think uh, that may be the place, let me, let me uh, propose, because again, I'm not at all a specialist in the US economy or politics, but that is that may be the place where to look for answers. And, and in fact, the, the progress of, of the care agenda, in particular in Latin America, has emerged from a strong feminist mobilization and uh, from coalitions with those who uh, require the care. Uh, and, and not only childcare, but also long-term care, as you, as you mentioned. So, so the, the claims to the state, the idea that states should provide these services has been very, very strong and very, very much taken on board by, by feminist uh, movements. And I think um, that's part of the answer, along with progressive uh, governments. The other thing that has happened, and it happened in Argentina three days ago, is that by arguing that the, the investment in care services brings jobs, creates jobs. There were inroads that were not there before. It's, it's not only now an issue of women and women's productivity and the idea that this activates women or allow women to enter the labor force. It's also the jobs that are created, the income Eleanor uh, mentioned that is spent, the, the creation of other jo in jobs in other sectors. And that argument is particularly important at this stage as, a, as the recovery um, uh, kicks start, but not everywhere and not evenly everywhere. So I think, I think those coalitions are uh, important. Uh, and, and I think it, it explains why it has made progress uh, in, in other places. And the other thing I wanted to, to point is that then there are the issues of the design of the policies. Not all policy designs leave vis-a-vis -vis services, vis-a-vis, -vis, um, I don't know, cash, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the creation of, of uh, a, a public registry of uh, personal workers, for example, uh, and therefore the creation of um, um, uh, formal employment, as opposed to places where the, the, the subsidy is given to the families and then um, the, the employment is not decent uh, and, and you have amongst other phenomena uh, um, informal migrant uh, domestic workers, for example. So, so I would say that the, once you have the decision, also the issues of, of policy design and care policy design to make these care policies transformative, truly transformative, it is important. And that's why I, I pasted the link to the 2018 care report, ILO care report, because I mean, all these issues, um, including the migration that another king uh, uh, helped us uh, draft, uh, are, are there very much um, um, laid out. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Valeria. And I just like to point out, in case anybody's not following the chat, that um, as was mentioned, there's a lot of discussion there, but also people have shared a number of different tools and probably want to check that out. Um, would any other panelists like to respond before we... Amy has her hand. Oh, Amy has her hand up. Good. Okay, Amy. So I really just wanted to highlight and reiterate some of the things that Valeria mentioned about the workforce, some of the conversation in the chat. I think that there is, you know, when confronted with evidence about shared economic prosperity that results from investments in the care economy, the, the failure to take those seriously, I think has to be at least in part attributed to kind of a deep ambivalence about women's work um, and kind of identifying care work as, um, as feminine work and therefore having, assigning a lower value, assigning, kind of having, um, feeling tensions and conflicts about paid versus unpaid work and kind of cultural norms there. So I do think that um, you know it's not only the crisis level that was confronted during the pandemic of families who were seeking to care for their families, but also that there was kind of a at least a, a little bit of a microphone put to women who were experiencing this 
tension to the point of, to the breaking point and the incredible stress and tension that within families that placed where you know many people felt like they had no other option than to leave the workforce altogether in order to meet those caregiving needs i think that's something that has to be factored in when the economic evidence is so clear and, de and well demonstrated included by my co-panelists thank you uh, lenore yeah, just briefly, um, great responses and great um, comments, Beth. You know, I think that I want to maybe be a voice of a little bit of hope that at least in the United States, um, we live in a country that has been shaped by neoliberalism, by a sense that we are best off when we rely on the market, when we are individuals operating uh, without you know, without social supports. And we live in a country that's deeply shaped by racial stratification and racism uh, stemming from chattel slavery and continuing to the present day in, in many forms that we, really, we all know about. Um, and I think that the fact that we see from the Biden-Harris administration, the types of proposals that have been made is a very good sign. I am as frustrated, if not more than everyone else, you know, we're all uh, you know, incredibly angry, I think, about the fact that this legislation has stalled, but I think we need to also be smart and strategic and keep pushing and not despair, especially at this particular moment as we come out of the recovery. And I'll just repeat what I think is so partial, you know, what's so important to hammer on when you hear Joe Manchin say deficits, 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 I can argue about that being the wrong question till I'm blue in the face. But we also need to make the clear argument that investing in care benefits the economy overall. It benefits all of us economically, as well as morally, spiritually, in every other way. So I think that's a piece where we're getting closer to people understanding that, and we need to keep pushing, despite the many, many structural barriers that we, that we still face. Thank you. OK, maybe we could take a question or two from the room. People who would like to ask a question? Is that you? Because <laughs> you're pointing at someone else. Yes, yes please. <laughs> so, so I really enjoyed all of these presentations. And I think you've all made sort of a really compelling case for the economic sense of investing in the care infrastructure. So maybe kind of flipping a little bit back the comment that you have sort of, you know, what are the barriers? Is I'm wondering at this point of crisis, what are the new opportunities? Who are the new potential allies? So I'm thinking of congresspersons who are in states where they have low labor force participation rates among women, high unemployment rates. They have industry leaders coming to them say, hey, I need more workers. You need to bring more workers in. I'm thinking, ooh, maybe these are people who'd be willing to listen to this cause who maybe weren't previously. Also healthcare industry leaders who may be seeing things differently in terms of their own interests. So what comes to my mind is like, okay, where do we have some new opportunities to lean in? And would love thoughts from people here in the room or the panelists on sort of maybe some opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Great, great question. Would anybody like to pick that up in the room or on the panel? Uh, Lenore, is your hand up from before or is it newly up? Um, it was up from before, but I'll just say I think that uh, there, you know, probably in 10 minutes we can't have a super detailed strategic conversation, but I think that to keep pushing on exactly the groups that this, I don't know who the speaker was, unfortunately we on the Zoom can't see the room, um, but to keep pushing on all of those groups and also to push on the generational uh, changes that are happening in this country. I think the fact that um, you know, the rising, the generation that's going to be rising to economic and political power may have a pretty different sense of uh, what the importance of care is given, you know, that their young adult life now has been shaped by the pandemic. And so I think we really have to uh, also see that as another group to, to push on. Thank you. Uh, uh Beth, uh, but there's one person here in the room, maybe before you, Ariane, go ahead. Well, I, I also wanted to answer Anita's question. Um, even though it's clearly supplemental, employers are more interested, and we're having another workshop tomorrow morning, which looks particularly at what unions may do to negotiate care. 
and how they can push employers. Um, there's in New York, um, uh, Senator Ramos has put forward a law to tax employers um, at something like, I can't remember what percent of, of payroll, which is a model that is being used in a lot uh, in something like 20 to 30 countries internationally to generate more um, workplace related child care. So um, I think, yes, we are pushing on big investments, but there may also be scope to integrate things like child care and elder care. And again, uh, in New York, um, I think in 2011, the city negotiated a, a deal with SEIU, which um, combines child care benefits and elder care benefits also maybe a way to taking that forward so just wanted to both advertise the panel and put that into the mm. discussion sure thank you okay beth i i appreciated the the uh, uh, estimates of the multi multiplier effects of of care right the the employment for women and the etc et that lenore and amy talked about and the uh, growth, uh, gr uh, the um, care report of ILO did too. But I think in addition to the women, to the effect on women's employment, I think we should also think about, as you said, I think, uh, uh, Mika, the intergenerational effect, which is that those children who don't get the, the care the, the, the longer run effect of these care policies is in the next generation. It's not just about women working more, it's about their children who are cared for will be able to do more. Those who get the care, those who get the um, schooling, those who get the health care, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, helping the pe uh, people with disabilities and stuff, those we can actually estimate. What, what is the effect of that on the future growth of the US? Because that the growth of the US is something that people like to talk about and want to and really care about. So if you also say, look, you know, it's not just about helping women uh, have, you know, be employed. It's about also helping the, the young generation be be better citizens and better more productive workers in the future i think that that might be so that's a, an intergenerational impact that we can uh we can also uh look into to further strengthen the uh the argument at least because we're in the macro we're we're in the macro session I think sort of that kind of intergenerational impact is an important one to, to think about. Thank you. Okay, do we have another question or comment, follow up on anything that was raised? Are there any in the chat, in the Q&A? Any questions? Um, yeah, so there was a question in in the in the Q and A about um, making this uh, argument in in states or areas where there's a birth rate decline. Getting back to that demographic issue that Beth was emphasizing. So, if you're in this context of declining numbers of children, does it make it harder to make the argument for the childcare need? I mean, I think I would just, I would just, um, if I could say that the, the, it's the, the system is so underfunded that, you know, to get to the level of, you know, what is needed now, I think still accounts for if there's going to be a declining birth rate. And I also know that in the, in the U.S., our childcare system does cover costs from children, age birth to 13. So that's gonna cover a wide range of care also for school age children before and after school care, summer and vacation. So, you know, thinking a lot about a continuum of childcare and there are definitely people who would argue that, you know, kids in middle school and high school, there is still kind of care that needs to be accounted for there. Um, so I think I would look at that as a signal that in order for people to contemplate who are young having families, they need to feel more secure that there's going to be support for them and they're not going to be again kind of struggling to reinvent the wheel 
for themselves and for their, you know, in their peer groups. So, and that also could have a reinforcing and um, beneficial outcome. Thank you. Okay, I think we have maybe time for just one more question. And there was one in the chat about just some successes, especially at the state level that um, people might want to note um, and the panel on an up note. Does anybody want to talk about a, a success? Let's not have the dreaded silence. Yeah, on. no, I, I can jump in. I mean, I think in addition to what I said before, which you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, I think the growth of paid leave at the state level, I put a link in the chat to a report and there's there's many resources out there that was just one I could find very quickly, but um, the paid leave is is really growing on a state basis in, in the United States and we need to keep that momentum up. It's a really important form of um, economic benefit and also in terms of that balance between uh, sort of formal care structures and family care, um, paid leave is a great example of something that that you know serves kind of all of those needs at once so we should uh, look to that state level growth as a real win great thank you Lenore last comments okay well thank you everyone so much for a very interesting and productive discussion and we'll have a short break now we'll reconvene at three thank you everyone Thank you. It was great. Thank you very, very much. Good to see you, Valeria. Bye-bye.